Yesterday, we, um, we actually tested, of course. On Monday, we had talked about um, the regions of Georgia, those physiographic regions that um, our state, the, the regions that we find in our state, and today we're going to begin talking about some of Georgia's key physical features. We'll spend the rest of this day, tomorrow, and then Friday, hopefully, um, we'll actually do something with what we have learned this week, Georgia's geography. So, um, hopefully, if we get there. Um, before we start, let's, let's look at this picture on the board. Anybody guess where that picture might have been taken? Taken in Georgia. That is not the old Capitol building. What, Josh? Um, you're not not too far off. That looks nothing like Bass Pro Shop. That's about 120 years removed from today. Yes. No, it's actually taken right here, about a, a mile and a half up the river. Um, after the dam, before the bridge. And it's not that little piece of concrete that sticks in the middle of the river. Um, this was actually a mill. Something was made there. They used the water to run the machinery inside the mill. And the reason I'm showing you that, and the reason I ask you that, is because of what we're going to talk about today. The fall line is what enabled people to, yes, okay, what enabled um, people in Georgia to operate machinery, to generate electricity, okay? So the fall line is simply where the Piedmont and the coastal plain come together. That's all it is. There's nothing mysterious about it, you know, there's not a big black line drawn across the state of Georgia, but you can see it. If you know what you're looking for, you can tell where it goes from the Piedmont region to the coastal plain region. Um, one of the things we look for are hills or mountains. You don't have those in the coastal plain. You do have hills in the Piedmont. Where we are right now is the highest point in Milledgeville. It's a hill. Um, and if you get out and start walking around it, you realize pretty quickly, this is a hill. Um, you don't have that in the coastal plain. The, the fall line, as we've talked about before, runs from, in Georgia, it runs from Columbus through Macon to Augusta. Uh, but remember, the fall line actually begins in Alabama. And it runs through Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, into Virginia, actually up through Delaware. And part of that, again, is in Georgia. The part that's in Georgia is from Columbus to Augusta. <clears throat> in the Piedmont, in the mountains, the soil tends to be very rocky. It's very hard. Remember, we're sitting on top of what? Big stone mountain. Stone mountain? Yeah. We're sitting on top of stone mountain. Stone mountain is just the part we can see. The rest of it's underground. So rivers have a hard time eroding that type of material. They do it, but it takes millions of years. Um, and so in the northern part, in the Piedmont, above the fall line, rivers tend to be uh, very fast flowing and very rough. White water, that's what you see. Compare that to south of the fall line. The soil is much softer. It's sandy. Water has an easier time eroding that type of soil. And the rivers tend to get very wide and very deep. Um, so that's a big difference. One of the big things about the fall line is it creates waterfalls. And that um, had a tremendous impact on our early history. Let's say that I'm one of the original settlers of Savannah, but I don't want to stay in Savannah. I want to explore 
So I get in my canoe or my boat and I begin to move upstream. I'm paddling. What's going to happen when I get to the fall line? Am I going to paddle my boat up a waterfall? No, No, I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to stop, right? I'm going to stop, beach my boat, tie my canoe up to a tree, and begin to walk, or what else? I'm going to quit. I'm going to stay right there. And so the fall line has an impact on our early history, that physiographic that physical characteristic has an impact on our history um, simply because people didn't want to cross the waterfall. Um, also, power. They became a power source for um, early Georgia communities that were created along the fall line. Um, not just electricity, that's certainly something in the 1900s. Water power. Somebody. You are trying to move on a river that's north of the fall line. You're not going. Even today, um, the Chattahoochee and the Santa River are used. What else? Well, let's. That was a picture before I told you that was a picture. I'm just, I'm just checking. So, again, um, the fall line, where did I say it started? Before that. In Alabama. Um, and then it, it, it actually, we can identify the fall line up through Virginia, okay, and Delaware. So, um, if we were to, to cut out a piece of the earth, um, it would look something like this. Um, imagine this is Brasstown Bald. How high, how high is Brasstown Bald? 4,784 4, feet high, right? Okay. So all of this would be what region? Dang it. All of that would be what region? Hey, hush, I'm talking, you don't. So all of this would be what region? You got the mountains, then you got the Piedmont, and then the red line represents what? Fall line, so cut the All right, imagine if you would, this is Brasstown Ball, we said Taha. 4,784 feet in height. Milledgeville sits on this red line. What's the elevation of Milledgeville? Anybody know? 330 feet above sea level. So if we start at the ocean and we walk to Milledgeville, or even if we drive to Milledgeville, we're going to increase in 30 feet in about 150 miles, roughly. If I climb to the top of Brasstown Ball, and I drive down to Milledgeville, I will have gone down almost, in fact, I will, have gone down 4,000 feet, about 4,100 feet. What does that tell you? Where is it steep? Where is the land steep? Where? In the Piedmont and the mountains, right? About the same distance from the ocean to the fall line and the fall line to the brass town ball. But yet, the decrease in elevation, there's a difference of about 4,100 feet. Um, so, those rivers do run fast. Uh, they are trying to 
um, or they are eroding the rock surface of the earth, and it takes longer. Therefore, rivers are shallow. By the way, did y'all see there was flooding in North Georgia yesterday? Bunch of, oh yeah, bunch of it. Um, Miss Karen and I own a camper, and so we're on several different camping things on Facebook, and there were pictures of campers floating in the river. They're not supposed to float. <laughs> it flooded and washed them away. Well, they're not supposed, they will float, but they're not supposed to. Uh, well, they got out. So, yeah. All right. So, as we've, as we've already stated, um, the fall line is important, or it has been important to the historical growth of Georgia. People got to the fall line. They either stopped or they kept going by foot. Um, a lot of the places that they stopped at developed trading posts. And so now people in the Piedmont and people in the coastal plain can swap. They can trade goods. Who was primarily living in the Piedmont early in Georgia's history? It wasn't the white trash Europeans. Native Americans. Native Americans, that's right. So what happens, I'm a, I'm a Native American, I'm a Cherokee, I live in the Piedmont, I hunt deer, I skin the deer, I have deer hide, people in the coastal plain, white trash Europeans, okay? They live near the coast, so they have fish, they have seashells, they have other things that come from the ocean. We can trade. And as we trade, we're not only trading stuff, but we come to know about each other's culture. And that culture rubs off on each group. So um, because of these trading posts, not just because of the trading posts, but certainly because of them in part, uh, we have four cities that grow up on the fall line. We have Augusta. That's the second oldest city in Georgia after Savannah. It was actually the first capital of Georgia, of the state of Georgia. Um, and it is on the Savannah River. The Savannah River starts up here as uh, the Tugaloo River, and then it turns into the Savannah River and flows to the ocean. Um, and you can see the fall line there at Augusta, Savannah River. Milledgeville sits somewhere in this area. Um, it's the fall line of the Oconee River. When Milledgeville was founded, and remember, it was founded as a planned city. It was going to be the capital of Georgia. Uh, one of the reasons they put it here is because of the Oconee River. People could travel up the river to the fall line. Um, they could transport goods from here to Savannah pretty easily. Um, and so the Oconee River, Macon, or actually just a little north of Macon, um, you find the fall line on the Mulgee River. And um, I've got some pretty, pretty cool pictures. And then finally, um, the Chattahoochee River at Columbus. Um, and again, as Georgia becomes more mechanized, as they become more industrial, uh, the fall line is helpful because of that water power, those waterfalls. They're able to harness that water and use it to power different equipment, different machinery. Now, um, this is the Savannah River at Augusta, and this is the fall line. Now, what do you notice about this? It's a nice straight line. Can I tell you, there are no straight lines in nature. Unless it's a really straight tree, there are no straight lines. Um, if something is growing, it's going to take the path of least resistance. If it's a river, it's going to take the path of least resistance, and it might go like that. There are no straight lines in nature. This is actually part of the Augusta Canal. It was part of a dam that was built to divert water into the canal. But look to the right, and what do you see? Rock. That's part of the fall line. 
you start moving south and you don't see this because you're moving into the coastal plain. So pretty interesting picture. Somebody said that um, they had a picture of their grandfather playing in that area as a child, which is a pretty cool picture to have. All right, so that's the Savannah River. This is the Oak Mulkey River State Park. Anybody ever been to High Falls State Park? Okay. Were you one of those people that ignored the warning signs and went out on the rocks? Yeah. What do those signs say? Do not go out on the rocks. You will die. Do not go out on the rocks. You will die. There. Do not go out on the rocks. You will die. And of course, what do people do? They go out on the rocks and they they die. Um, seriously, the Department of Natural Resources makes a huge emphasis on not going out on the rocks. The water's not always running like that. Sometimes those rocks are bare, right? And you can walk out on them. But if that water comes up in a hurry and you're not paying attention, what's going to happen? You're going to die. Um, a couple of years ago, the DNR had like, oh, I don't know, several rescues they had to, to try and make. And they finally decided, you know what? If you're going to be stupid and if you're going to be stupid and you're going to go out on the rocks, um, we're going to charge you to come rescue you. We're going to give you a bill afterwards. Or else what? We won't come get you. Uh, they'll take you to court. You'll pay it. And if you die, your family's going to pay it. Then you just commit suicide and you die. Um, but it's a pretty, pretty cool picture because it shows this change in elevation that takes place. You can see it. As the river flows, you see that it's flowing downhill. You look at the ground, you see big rocks, you see this trail, you can see that it's actually decreasing as it moves from left to right. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so, and this is, and I didn't show a picture of Milledgeville because um, you can see that any day. Um, but this is Cayuta Falls. This is at the Chattahoochee Fall Line in Columbus. And you can see all the rocks. As you move further south of Columbus, that river gets really broad. It's been dammed in a lot of places. Um, Columbus actually removed several dams a couple of years ago to allow the river to run naturally, freely. Um, but you can see the rock. You can see... This is where the fall line is. All right. The second thing we're going to talk about today, and I don't know that we'll get finished with this today, but we'll certainly try, is the Okefenokee Swamp. The Okefenokee Swamp. Okefenokee is a Seminole Indian word that means land of the trembling earth. What are they talking about? Well, the land is not very solid. It's loose. Um, and so they felt that when you walked on it, it would move. So hence the name, the land of the trembling earth. Um, it is the largest freshwater swamp in North America. 681 square miles. Takes up part of four, parts of four Georgia counties. Uh, Charlton, um, Ware, Brantley, and Clinch. That's not important. You don't have to remember that. But it does help us think about the size of the swamp. It is not the largest swamp in North America. What is? The Everglades. But is the Everglades a freshwater swamp? No, it is not. It's a brackish swamp. It's a combination of salt and fresh water. Uh, but it is largest freshwater swamp in North America. It is a wetland, which means it is protected by the government. 
just south of Waycross, if you look over Emily's right shoulder, if you'll point to that big green spot right there. Yeah, right there. That's the Okie Finoki Swamp. Waycross is right there. It's just south of Waycross, Georgia. And then it actually goes all the way to the Florida line. So, again, it is a big swamp. Um, there's like 400 different species of vertebrates. What's a vertebrate? Uh, it has a backbone. Okay, it has a spine. Um, 400 or 200 of those 400 are birds. So a lot of different kinds of birds. Um, there's about 60 different kinds of reptiles. What would a reptile be? Lizard, snake. Alligators, okay. Um, and there are, the interesting thing is when I was your age, alligators were almost extinct. They had been hunted almost to extinction. And then um, they are, today they're, they were a protected species. They're no longer protected anymore. Um, you do have to, if you want to go alligator hunting, you do have to have a license. You got to draw a tag, blah, 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 blah. But um, it used to be that the Okefenokee Swamp was the only place you were going to find alligators. Today, they're as far north as Lake Sinclair. Um, I saw a picture of one that was stretched across a road in Wilkinson County. Road's about 20 feet wide. Gives you an idea of how big that alligator was. It's about 20 feet long, and he was probably, oh, I don't know, 70, 80 years old. He was old. I saw a picture of him. Oh, biologists can, you know, I mean, he was, something was wrong with him. He was, he died shortly after that. They actually captured him and then realized he was sick. He died. Uh, but they were able to to uh, to examine him and, and determine how old he was by running different tests. Um, so today, alligators are no longer a protected species. You can't just go out and kill them, but um, they're not protected like they used to be. Um, did y'all see um, the woman? I don't know if it was this weekend. It had to be. Um, she was like, teaching about the alligators. They had an alligator that was um, in an enclosure, had a little pool maybe about that deep. He was in there, and there was an open end, to it, and that's where she was. And she started throwing her hand like this, and she was talking about the alligator, and that gator chomped down on her hand and then, and then pulled her into the enclosure and started doing the death roll. Yeah. Started and her hand is, and you're not just going to open his mouth and pull out her hand. I mean, it crushed her hand. They were able to save it, but it crushed her hand. Um, she's he's doing the death roll. She wraps both legs around his head, and she and the thing about an alligator, an alligator is not just going to come up and chomp eat you. He's going to play with you a little while. He's going to do literally. It's called the death roll. An alligator. What's the death? An alligator grabs onto its prey and rolls, and it drowns its victim. So it's not going to kill you by eating you or by biting you. It's going to kill you by drowning you. And then he's going to take you, and he's going to stick you up under a log underwater or a rock, let you marinate a little bit, get good and soft and juicy, and then he's going to eat you. I've got a friend like PE at I mean funny. La 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 bro. It's sad. It was. It really was a sad story. But to, to finish the alligator and the woman, there's a guy, and you see him 
he comes running, he jumps over the wall, and he leaps on the back of that alligator and just bear hugs him until somebody, <laughs> until somebody's able to help the woman. They get her hand out, and then he's stuck on the back of the alligator. Um, but a lot of alligators in. Um, yeah, the lady's dog was eaten eventually. Yeah. After it marinated for a couple of days. Um, so if, if you're interested, if you're an outdoors person, if you like wildlife, um, that's a great place to go. And it is, it is a beautiful place. Um, it's, it's been preserved since about 1937. Um, and it was formed, it's actually formed by the Atlantic Ocean. And here's my picture. I didn't erase it. I left it up there for you. So back in the day, back, you know, millions of years ago, there was an offshore sandbar. Here was the Atlantic Ocean. Um, right here. Here's Carly swimming in the Atlantic Ocean. There she is. Millions of years ago. Um, and, and you've probably been to the, to the beach and you've seen an offshore sandbar. You can walk out to it or swim out to it and then you can be, you know. Well, that's what this was. As, as the water, as the waves would hit the sandbar, they would come over the top of it and they would dig out the ground or the ocean floor on this side. Well, what eventually happens to the ocean? It recedes, right? Over, you know, the ice age comes along, the ocean um, gets smaller. And if you look at a map, you can see well, the swamp's pretty close to the ocean. But after this water left, the salt water dried up, rain fell, rivers are formed, streams are formed. Um, and because of that wave action, you had a bowl or a depression in the earth. And then rain and runoff from streams, rivers, um, actually filled that with fresh water, and it developed into a swamp. So the ocean created the Okefenokee Swamp, <clears throat> and that's pretty cool. They began logging in 1910. There were not a lot of laws that prevented uh, people from doing that sort of thing. There were not a lot of laws that protected the land um, and so for 27 years, the Okefenokee was abused by logging companies. They would build railroads into the swamp, roads into the swamp, um, of course, machinery. They were cutting trees, timber, and bringing um, that out. And it just it left a mess. Well, in 1937, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president of the United States, signed into law the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge Act. What did it do? It protected the land. It protected the land and stopped those logging companies from taking advantage of it, from taking um, the timber off of or out of the swamp. Today, you can still see in some places where that took place. There's machinery that was left behind. Of course, Nature is pretty cruel. It will destroy anything that is left out. Um, a lot of that stuff has, you know, it's rusted. It's been taken over by um, different kinds of plants. So, all right. Um, tomorrow we'll finish this, and we will um, talk about some other stuff too, and hopefully get finished.